So this talk is entitled Spelling and the Brain. So I'm assuming that you are listening to this talk because you are particularly interested in spelling. Or maybe you are fascinated with the brain. Or maybe you're just having problems with spellings and brains. <laughs> but uh, I've been at this business of running around and trying to help parents and teachers help children learn to write better for almost 30 years now. And <clears throat> you can't do that very long without bumping into the problem of spelling. And I like to define my terms. That's kind of an old debate habit, right? He who defines the terms takes the upper position. So what is spelling? I mean, I suppose there's a dictionary definition of it. But it's certainly a weird thing. It's really unlike anything else we have to learn as English-speaking people. In some languages, it's not a problem at all. Spanish, right? It always works. You don't really have to learn to spell in Spanish the way you do in English. And of course, one of our problems is English is not one language. It's a conglomeration of many languages with Latin and Greek and a little bit of French and some German and some Anglo-Saxon and who knows what else. So sometimes the phonetic systems actually compete with each other. It's certainly not like math. <clears throat> math has rules that work all the time. It's not really like science. I mean, science has interesting stuff. Spelling is just, <laughs> what is it? So I have created a definition of spelling, which I will share with you. I've honed and refined this over many years. So here you go. Spelling is the correct retrieval of sequentially stored, virtually random bits of information. <laughs> and even if you know all the rules, some of those in themselves are somewhat random because there are exceptions to almost every rule. Now, I'm going to say that again. And as I say it, I want you to think about in this definition, in this one sentence, what is the most important word? The one word that would help you become a better teacher of spelling. Spelling is the correct retrieval of sequentially stored, virtually random bits of information. What do you think? Retrieval, that's important. Bits, Bits that's good. <laughs> Correct, that's probably important. I mean, they're all important. <clears throat> Some of you said it, and I would argue that sequential is the most important word to help you understand the nature of the activity. Because to spell a word correctly, you not only have to get all the right letters, you have to get them out in the right order. And if you do not, it is wrong, right? Now, you've probably seen words like this, <clears throat> or that, or that. It's very popular. I've even seen that. <laughs> OK, so stop for a moment and realize none of those are correctly spelled English words. But it is very possible that children would write those things. Why? One of the really interesting things I discovered some time ago, and it's kind of self-evident, like obvious, like duh, but when you think about it, it's very significant in our business of teaching and learning. And that is, you can't get something out of a brain that isn't in there to begin with. Right? You won't get a correctly spelled word out of a brain that doesn't have a correctly spelled word. Likewise. Why would you get that out of a brain? It, you never would have put it in, although maybe you did accidentally put in wrong information. So one of the problems with written language is that when you see a word, I'm going to show you a word in a second. Look at the screen. And when you see this word, you will see it all at once. Boom. You can't not see it all at once. It is impossible to not see that whole word all at once. Therefore, 
there is not a sequential storage of the spelling information contained in this word. There is a, a spatial or global storage, but it is not a sequential storage. It goes into your brain simultaneously. You with me on this? All right. Now, when you hear a word, I'm going to spell a word for you, right? E-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E. -E. I am forced by nature to say it, and you are forced by nature to hear it one letter at a time. I cannot possibly say all the letters at once. <laughs> no. <clears throat> so spelling, by its nature, is a sequential activity. Visual input, by its nature, is not sequential. It's simultaneous. Auditory information, by nature, is sequential. Things always have to go in an order, right? So that is very significant because many children who have a hard time learning to spell may be getting information scrambled on the way in because there's no guarantee that what's on the page is what gets into their in their eyes and through their eyes and into their brain and i would say you know you may have a child who is kind of mildly dyslexic you might call them that i would probably just call them not cooked yet <laughs> right? they're, they're going to grow out of it it's just a phase and um it might include a majority of eight or nine year old boys. They are scrambling stuff on the way in. And if it's scrambled on the way in, how are you going to get it out reliably? And then you get this mixing up of letters. Now, you would somehow think that kids who read well would naturally spell well. But this is not always the case. In fact, one of my children, who was one of the slower ones, who really didn't read much at all till she was eight, eight and a half, ended up being the, the best speller of the crew. Because she was reading so slowly, she was forced to look at letters and figure out words for a lot longer time. Whereas if you start just looking at whole words, you don't have to have them correctly spelled to know what they are. In fact, there was this cute thing circling around on the internet some time ago, and it basically said something like, Harvard research shows that you don't have to have words correctly spelled to read them. If you just get the first letter and the last letter, you can mix up all the ones in the middle and still read it. And it's all totally done that way. So you're reading this thing thinking, ha ha, it's proving itself. And it's kind of cute. Of course, if you show that to an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, hopeless. But it does show that gradually over time, we stop looking at letters and we start just looking at whole words and chunks of words because we have enough you know, speed and experience to know what those are. So sometimes kids who get that level of speed and experience and start reading quickly at a younger age, because they love to read, don't necessarily learn to spell from reading because they're already jumping past the need to look at letters. Does that all make sense? Now, you've also got these kids who <clears throat> aren't reading or spelling, and you move into that whole problem of, OK, what, how do you teach this? Right? They're, they have this visual confusion that's going on. And so what I have come to believe is that it is possible to teach spelling more effectively to certain groups of children, possibly even most of them, without showing them words. Now, a long, long time ago, everyone used to spell better. And it's not just because now we have spell checkers and nobody cares. How did people learn to spell 100, 120, 140 years ago? We don't really know because none of us were around then. But we do have the artifact that shows us what it was probably like. And the artifact is the spelling bee. Have you ever watched a spelling bee? Right? So you, you notice that in a spelling bee, there's no paper involved. It is entirely 
a verbal auditory loop. Right? There's no paper involved. I believe that represents the way in which children used to learn to spell. And one of the things that changed that in the 20th century was the gradual rise and eventual ubiquity of photocopied or dittoed or workbook or easily reproduced and distributed printed material. And then that kind of became the cash cow for publishers and the solution to how do you teach a bunch of kids all at once. But if you go back before, when paper was still pretty expensive, you couldn't have done that. But everyone learned to spell. So I'm a pretty good speller. And I don't credit the Los Angeles schools where I grew up. I credit my mother because she's the one that taught me to spell. Now, I went to school. And you probably remember the old system. They would give you the list of 20 words on Monday. And you were supposed to study them. And then you would take the pretest on Wednesday or Thursday. And if you got a 90% on the pretest, you wouldn't have to take the real test, which was stupid enough. <laughs> but it gets worse because then, no matter what grade you get on the final spelling test on Friday, you get a new list on Monday. All right, that's just a system that's set up to fail a certain percentage of kids. But that's the system I remember in school. Did you all have something similar to that? OK, I do not remember writing those words to learn them, or looking at them, or doing anything, except I remember my mother somehow got the list of words. <laughs> and she would drill me verbally on these words whenever we were around. And if I was helping her fix dinner in the kitchen, or in the car on the way to violin lesson, or on our little boat when we would be sailing, she was always running spelling words on me. And she'd be like, OK, Andy, next word is special. And I would give it my best guess. S-P-E-S-H-I-L. She would then say, well, good guess. But it's not S-H, it's C-I. So it must be kind of an Italian weird thing. Because sometimes C-I says shh, like an S-H. And that it's, it's like special, like speciality, but without the itty, just the special. Try again. So I would try again. S-P-C-I-A-L. Then she would say, you're getting closer, but you missed the first vowel. Remember, every syllable has to have a vowel. Special. OK. S-P-E-C-I-A-L. Then she would say, you got it. Now say it again just to be sure that wasn't an accident. S-P-E-C-I-A-L. We would do this every day. Every day with all the words. So by the end of the week, I knew that I knew that I knew these words. And I would sit at my little desk in my little fourth or fifth grade classroom, and the teacher would say, OK, children, the next word is special. You are all very special to me. Special. <laughs> and I remember myself sitting there whispering the word to myself. I knew I could say it. I knew if I could say it, I could hear it. If I could hear it, I could write it down. And if I could write it down, I could get 100%, which was the real goal. S-P-C-I-A-L. Yeah. But you had to do it quiet enough that nobody accused you of cheating or something, right? And that's how I learned to spell. I credit my mother and her use of the school spelling list. But she knew the best way to do this was this verbal drill. Now. How did she know how to do this? Her mother did it to her. How did her mother know how to do this? That was the method of study that was used in schools in the one-room schoolhouse in rural Arkansas, where she grew up in the first decade of the 1900s. It's always been there, but it's died. So 
I do believe that if you have kids who are not learning to spell easily or well with a visual practice system, whatever that might be, you might do very well to get rid of that and just go to the ear and work on the mouth and the ear and build it in through the correct sequence. Because if you get it in the right sequence, then you can get it out on the right sequence much more easily. Now, I will admit that there's a smaller percent of children who are more auditorily confused than they are visually confused. These are our beloved tactile and kinesthetic learners, right? And they just, they have confusion. So they don't necessarily hear everything in the right order. Things can get scrambled auditorily on the way in. And so that's a harder problem. Then you've, you've got to, you know, go to something else. I would probably say, learn the sign language alphabet and try to learn by doing it with your fingers. D, A, D, M, O, M, right? Uh, T, R, E, E, so, you know, and work in that zone. Um, because then there's that sequential aspect and the kinesthetic aspect that's going to keep the auditory information more organized on the way in. And, you know, at, at a certain point, you have to start writing it more fluently. But for most kids, at a younger age, I would suspect verbal auditory practice is going to be more effective than workbook style visual practice. But not everybody. Uh, so you have to kind of evaluate, you know, are you, what are you doing and are you happy? Is it working? If it's working, okay, keep doing what you're doing. But if it isn't, then you probably need to change. What's that old definition of insanity? To keep doing what you've been doing and expect different results. Well, spelling, I think this falls right into that category. Now, let's shift over a little bit and talk about the brain. Because we have learned a whole lot about the brain in the last 50 years. We've learned a whole, whole lot more about the brain in the last decade or so. And it's very exciting. I, I love learning about the brain. And we do know that the brain stores information by neurons making connections with other neurons. Right? You have at least 100 billion neurons and then another tri trillion or so glial cells that we don't know exactly what they do, but they, they're kind of like hold the space between the neurons and they they help flush out toxins. A lot of people think the glial cells are connected somehow with intuitive, nonverbal, non-concrete sensory impressions and thinking and all that. But we do have the ability to observe neurons. So a neuron is a cell and it has coming out one side axon, coming out the other side dendrites. And what happens is axons of one connect with dendrites of another, right? So this is a simplistic example, but this is kind of how it works. You got a baby, baby's born. You look at the baby, looks pretty normal, but you want to check, right? So just to check, you give this baby a little pinch, pinch. Now that pinch creates an electrical current activation in the, in the end of the nerve on the skin, which then travels up the nerves into a part of the brain where you have a bunch of neurons sitting around waiting to store the information what it feels like to be pinched. And then the axons and dendrites of various neurons touch and you feel the pinch and say, eh. <laughs> but this is not quite the right reaction. So a little bit later, pinch. Now, the, the nerves that did it before do it again. It goes up into the brain where the neurons that did it before do it again. The axons and dendrites do it again. And you feel it a little stronger. And so you say, eh. but this is still not quite the right reaction. So one more time, just to be sure, pinch. Axons, dendrites did it before, do it again. And you feel it and you, and then mom's like, okay, he's fine. That's a normal reaction. Now, that's simplistic, but honestly, that is the way in which we store all the information from what it feels like to be pinched to what our mother's face looks like 
to how to do a layup or conjugate a Latin verb or play a minuet on a violin. Everything that we recognize, know, remember, or can do, we can because we have neurons connected to other neurons. You with me so far? Okay. Now, there are variables in the way that these neurons make connections. So the three variables are frequency or repetition, i.e., the number of times something has to happen. Intensity, meaning the strength of the stimulation. And then duration, which would be reinforcement over time. So these three variables are always present whenever we're ever trying to learn or remember or do anything. Frequency, intensity, and duration. Now what's interesting is that when one of these variables is higher, the others can be lower. They're like factors, right? So when we get pinched as a child, we learn that pretty quickly. It doesn't take too many repetitions to store the information what it feels like to be pinched. Once we know that information, <laughs> the baby may cry before the pinch because it knows what's going to happen. It's anticipating the discomfort, right? And we use these things to learn various things throughout life, and I think that some things lend themselves more towards one or the other. I, I would guess that most of us learn multiplication primarily by frequency, right? So we just drill those math facts until we know them. And it can take 10 or 100 or 1,000 times. And at some point, we have had enough repetition that all the neurons that store the information of 6 times 7 have made permanent or semi-permanent neural connections. And the next time you need to retrieve that information, it's there. Um, Intensity. If, if you think back in your childhood, try to remember being in third grade and try to remember something from school in third grade. If you can't, try fourth. Do you remember something? OK, good. Now ask yourself, would you call this thing important or interesting? Or maybe both. Interesting. Most people would say, Interesting. The thing I remember from third grade, I remember it because it was interesting. Or in my case, actually because it was painful. I remember very little from third grade. can't remember the teacher or anything, what her name was, what she looked like. I have only a vague impression of where the classroom was. don't remember any of the people in the group. I only know that we studied Japan and that I stapled my finger. That is my most clear memory of third grade. But not because of the pain of stippling my finger. The reason I remember it is because I said to my teacher, I stapled my finger. And she said, no, you just got a paper cut. And I said, no, I stapled my finger. I know I stapled my finger. And she said, no, I think you just got a paper cut. And to this day, the outrage <laughs> of not being believed by my third grade teacher is one of the only two memories I have of that entire year of school. So that's a case of intensity, right? Duration is when we stretch repetition over time. I, I would guess that I learned the parts of government this way. I, I don't remember when I learned this like I remember when I learned multiplication tables, which was with my parents at home during third grade, mostly in the bathtub. But I, I know it, three parts of government. I think I heard it a little bit in maybe fifth grade, and then I heard it maybe again in middle school, and then maybe I heard it again in high school, and maybe someone else reinforced it somewhere along the line. I don't know how many repetitions, but it seems like it was a very long period of time. But ultimately, I know there's a judicial, a legislative, and an executive branch to the United States government. I don't remember when or exactly, but I know that I know it, and I would say duration was that part. Now, these three variables are always present in teaching anything to anyone, right? And you can learn to maximize these things. 
um, for example, if I wanted, to, Clifford, uh, let's say I want to teach you something, okay? Uh, I want to teach you the Japanese word for toilet, because it might come in handy someday. You never know. <laughs> so I want your home phone, your work phone, your cell phone, your wife's cell phone, and any other phone number you might possibly be at. And I'm going to call you five times every day for the next week and tell you this little tiny bit of information, the Japanese word for toilet. Will he learn this thing? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, he won't need a repetition of 35. Probably after the second day, he'll be like, yeah, I got it. Obenjo, OK, goodbye. Stop calling me. Now, if there isn't reinforcement over time, that could degrade, and he could ultimately forget that. And that would be an appeal to frequency or repetition. I could also say, Clifford, I'm going to tell you this one time. You're not going to hear it again. Nobody else is going to tell you, and you can't go look it up. But if you know this one year from now, I will give you $1 million in gold bullion tax-free. Will he remember? Yes, he will be afraid to go to sleep at night. He will be forcing this into his brain with self-inflicted repetition. Obenjo, Obenjo, Obenjo. It's going to be the mantra of life for the year, right? I could also use the opposite approach to intensity. Say, Clifford, I'm going to tell you this one time. You're not going to hear it again. And if you don't know it one year from now, I will kill you. <laughs> that, that would be intensity also. But the million dollars would work better because the fear of death impedes learning. So, But we, we often do that kind of create intensity in various ways to motivate internally. Or um, if, if I were to say to you, um, I before E, you would say, OK, so why do you remember that? It rhymes. So there's an intensity to that rule because it rhymes that's more powerful than, say, saying it some other way. Of course, once you learn the rule, you have to learn all the exceptions to that rule, of which there are uh, a number of weird ones you have to seize. <laughs> you got it? All right. Then, probably the most effective thing, if I wanted to teach this to Clifford, without spending a million dollars, I would call him once a week for 35 weeks. So I would take that repetition and stretch it out over the maximum amount of time. He would probably have lifetime retention on that thing with no more reinforcement in the future, because that would be the most effective way. So uh, how do we apply these to the teaching of spelling in particular? Well. Uh, one of the things we know clearly is that some children need more repetition than other children, right? There's some kids that you just, they see it or hear it or you tell them 10 times and they know it and they're always going to know it and they're going to start writing it and spelling it and they'll, they'll, it won't be hard for them to spell this word because they had enough repetition because they had a brain that could do that. But you might have, in the same family, in the same classroom, a child who'd need 10, 30 times that same amount of repetition before they would have that same level of certainty and confidence, right? Which is why you know, a, a workbook is a problem in that it doesn't adjust itself for a student. It, it's an oxymoron. It does no, more, no work whatsoever. It continues on at its pace, giving a prescribed amount of repetition. If that repetition is too much, then the child, and you or I, would say, this is getting boring. I don't need, I know this already. Could we just get on with it? Right? So there's an irritation that builds there. And then if there's too little repetition, well, we tried to learn it, but we didn't. But we're going to go on to the next chapter, the next list, the next page, the next thing. And we tried to learn that, but we didn't really learn it. But we're going to go on because we got to finish this book by the end of the school year. And then what happens is you, you successfully don't learn a lot of what you're trying to learn. 
So if you do get a spelling or a workbook of any sort that does work, it's not because it was so great. It's more likely because it happily, accidentally, matched the amount of repetition that that student needed. That is why you know, the workbooks aren't, aren't, aren't going to work for everybody. Now, we do have, today, technology that is superior to that in terms of giving amount of repetition. Right? So there are certain programs that you could use on a computer that would give you enough repetition in a certain area until you demonstrated enough mastery and then move you on to the next thing. And that could happen in math or it could happen in spelling. And that's kind of a nice use of technology, but at the same time, it, it's going to be visually hyperstimulating. And if you've got a child who's likely to scramble stuff on the way in, that might not be the best way to go. Something more auditory would probably work better. And so, you know, it could be devised uh, to do that, but that problem of frequency and the appropriate amount of repetition will always be present, especially in spelling. Another uh, aspect of spelling would be intensity. So we remember little jingles like I before E, or when two, when two vowels go walking, or you know, we get these little things that are helpful. The problem is they're just not always right. They, they don't always work. So with every rule, jingle, or hint you memorize, you also have to memorize the exceptions to that. And then you just you, you have other problems. So that's not a, a complete solution. But um, a few examples of how you can use intensity. When I am teaching a writing class, I very often use an Aesop fable where the characters are talking to each other. And one of my favorites is the hare and the tortoise. And I like teaching this to children. And usually in the process of the lesson, I will get to the point where I will put a list of synonyms for said on the whiteboard. And I will get them to give me. What could you say instead of said? You know, screamed, whispered, shouted, screeched. You know, if I get far enough and prompted enough, I will usually get to the word laughed. And at that point, I will say, now, when you write the word laughed, don't try to write the word laughed. You'll probably get it wrong. Most kids would write L-A-F-F-E-D, which makes total sense. I say, don't write the word laughed, write la uga ha ed <laughs> Everybody say that. la uga ha ed Now, if you try to write la uga ha ed you will spell the word laughed. All right, so now you laugh at you chuckle at that. There's a humor. There's an absurdity. How did I know to do that? My mom. <laughs> she taught me. If you want to write the word laughed, just try to write la uga ha ed and, and I've had kids with a repetition of one time, or maybe two, in a class, go home and tell their parents, that writing class was really fun. And the teacher, he said, if you want to write the word laugh, don't write laugh, write la uga ha ed. <laughs> and then you know it. So it's a form of intensity. I took a child with me on a trip once. She was young. And uh, the great thing about going on a trip with dad isn't that you get to sit through writing seminars all day for a few days. The great thing about going on a trip with dad is you get to stay in a hotel. And the great thing about staying in a hotel is there's a pool. And if you are a dad and you take a kid on a trip and you don't get a hotel with a pool, ooh, that's a major offense. But so anyway, I took this child. She's pretty young. Uh, and I took her on a trip with me to San Diego, and uh, for some reason, the pool there, it was outside, because San Diego, of course, there was a hot tub. And this hot tub had great mounds of foam, like some, some toxic dump. Someone had <laughs> put way too much chemicals or something in this great foam. But, you know, if your wife was there, she wouldn't let you go near this thing. But she isn't. So you get in and play with the foam. <laughs> Now, when I am with my children, I'm, I was always running spelling words and math facts, spelling words and math facts, just verbally, because that's what my parents did to me. So I didn't know that all parents don't do that. Driving in the car, spelling words and math facts, you know, on the boat, spelling words and math facts. 
And so this idea of drill was not, it didn't bother me. It was like a game. So my kids kind of got used to this. So we're sitting in the hot tub and um, I, I, I don't know why I thought of this word. I'm guessing one just drove by, but I said, spell limousine. Now we're playing this game where if she spells it right, she gets to throw foam in my face. But if she spells it wrong, I get to throw foam in her face. And if she spells it and gets it right, then I get to try to mix her up by spelling it wrong. And she has to try to remember the correct so she gets to foam me more. And after I get foamed four or five times, we're done. She knows the word and we move on to something else, make continents or whatever, you know, homeschool parents crazy. <laughs> So anyway, limousine. Okay, now limousine is not a nice word in English, right? It, it's not spelled like it sounds. And it's just not a word you would really come across all that often. So she gives it her best shot. I foam her. I tell her how to spell it, <laughs> right? And then she tries again, and I foam her again. And then she gets it right, and then she foams me. And then I try to mix her up by putting all the letters in the wrong order. So we're foaming out. We finally got it, and she can spell this word. Okay, so we're moving on. About a year later, I was remembering this event, and I knew I was going to give a talk on spelling, so I was just curious. So I walked up to her, and she's probably, I don't know, 12 years old at this point. I just walked up to her and I said, do you still know how to spell limousine? Now, this is not a word she would have had in her active vocabulary in our demographic. We, we don't think or use limousines. <laughs> And she said, I think so. I said, try. And she spelled it, L-I-M-O-U-S-I-N-E. I thought, wow, the intensity of the small amount of repetition helped seal that in, and it's still there a year later. She's a couple of years later. She's about 15 or something. I just walked up to her one day out of the blue. I said, limousine. <laughs> and she said, Dad, do you think I'm ever going to forget that? <laughs> Humor me. OK, L-I-M-O-U-S-I-N-E. Then she graduated high school. We had a little graduation ceremony at our church. There's just a dozen kids, and they all got to give a little speech, right? And she, in the middle of her speech, says, and yes, Dad, I still know how to spell limousine. <laughs> So sometimes you can embed a little bit of repetition with a higher amount of intensity and get a good result, especially on really weird words like laughed and limousine, things that don't make sense. Duration is really just persistence over time, right? And I, I moved at one point in the last decade, and I found a box of stuff I hadn't seen for a very long time. And in this box was a binder of all the stuff I did as a freshman in college. And so I was kind of curious, like, what did I do? And so I started looking through and I found the section of papers I wrote for English class. And I was super curious to know what kind of writer I was at 19. And so I'm reading my papers, thinking, OK, uh, not bad. I could have done that better. What surprised me was the number of misspelled words. And I thought, I would not misspell those words now. Of course not. I have a spell checker. <laughs> but no, I know them now. And I obviously didn't know them well enough to catch it when I was 19, thereby proving the fact that while you kind of finish learning spelling around eighth grade, at least for most people, you can still improve over time. And then there's this really funny thing. I was sitting in my office, and this is, I was about 50 years old. I'm sitting there trying to write the word privilege, realizing I do not know how to spell this word. And I thought, this is dumb. I should know this word. I could learn this word if I would just do it. So I wrote it on a card, I stuck it in my pocket, and I drilled myself 10 times a day for a few days. Although, once I started teaching Latin, I realized if I had been a Latin student, I would have known how to spell this word because it's a compound, privy lege, right? So anyway, the idea is you can learn to spell. You, you don't have to stop. You can always improve. Um, but if you consider these uh, essential uh, factors, variables, 
frequency, meaning repetition, intensity, adding mnemonics or experiences, and then duration, patience, essentially. The other thing that frustrates a lot of parents is they'll have a child and he'll have a spelling lesson or a spelling test, he'll spell it correctly, and then two days later he'll be writing a story and spell it wrong. And you would think, hold on a minute, you know how to spell that word. Yeah, he does, but you weren't asking him to spell the word, you're asking him to write a story. Right? It's a very different thing. So one of the things I noticed is that in teaching writing, handwriting, spelling, and English composition are very different brain functions. They are so different that in young children, they don't even happen in the same part of the brain. Right? English composition happens in the language part of the brain, and that's where you're saying, okay, I've got to put words into sentences that make sense and sentences into a logical sequence. That's a language function, right? Handwriting and spelling have nothing to do with that. Handwriting, what is it? Art, basically art. You see a pattern, you try to copy that pattern, you try to copy it in a certain way, you try to copy it in a certain way a certain number of times so that it becomes automatic, so you don't have to remember how or look at an example, and you can reproduce it from memory, right? And then spelling, of course, is in a different part of the brain. So when you're writing a story and you come up to a spelling word and you don't have automatic ability to spell it, if you have to stop and go from the language part of your brain all the way over to the spelling part of your brain and search around and find it and carry it all the way back and put it in. By the time you've done that, you probably forgot everything you're trying to say. So children, as you or I would reasonably do, would sacrifice spelling for train of thought, right? So we have to understand and be a little bit patient. Just because you could spell something on demand doesn't mean you would do that automatically. And that's where the, the repetition builds in. So think about those variables, frequency, intensity, duration. One thing I will note, I will note, and then we'll move on, is one of the benefits of oral practice is that you can get more repetition in a shorter length of time. If you were to ask a child to practice or study spelling words by writing them 10 times, right? For some children, that could be a long time. Or maybe what would happen is what happened to my daughter. My daughter, I put her in third grade kind of as an experiment. I just wanted to see what would happen, <laughs> partly as an experiment, partly to save her mother's sanity. But anyway, it was a good school. And, and there were a lot of things I appreciated about the teacher in the school. But I quickly learned they were not going to teach her spelling because she had uh, brought home a piece of paper upon which she had written her spelling words each 10 times in an effort to learn them. The only problem is she didn't write them 10 times correctly. Not only that, like a game of telephone, the word kind of mutated <laughs> from the first repetition to the last repetition. And so I thought, man, if I'm going to teach this kid to spell, I'm going to have to do it the way my mom taught me. And we're going to get off the paper and go to auditory practice. I actually have kind of learned that you can put your kids in school, but you end up having to teach them everything yourself anyway. So, you know. All right. Uh, so here's the thing about auditory practice is you can get more repetition in a shorter period of time with less stress than having to write on paper. So. Uh, this idea of verbal practice. And then if you have a child like my son, who is number six out of my children, he is the most dyslexic person I have ever met. He did not read anything. He did not read four letter words till he was 11 years old. He did not read a book until he was 12 years old. And so spelling was pretty much impossible. Doing anything on paper was pretty much impossible. When 31 and 13 are indecipherable, you don't even do math on paper. So everything he did was basically me doing verbal auditory practice of math facts and spelling words and a little bit of geography and a lot of audiobooks. That was basically his education for, for quite a number of years. Um, but he needed a lot of repetition. 
And so we could never do it around his little sister because after the third time, she'd know how to spell it and just couldn't, couldn't restrain herself <laughs> from shouting out the correct stuff. And meanwhile, he's just getting angry. So we would go sneak off into the tree fort and sit there and practice spelling words for 10, 15 minutes. I'd call him on the phone. We'd practice spelling on the phone when I was traveling because that was the only way it could possibly be done. It's still, spelling's still tough for him. Uh, but of course, now he has spell checker. <laughs> you just have to be careful about those tricky homonyms. All right, let's shift over now and talk a little bit about phonics. Um, I have uh, said in the talk about um, when you teach children to read, a good phonics instruction system is important, and pretty much all experts agree. But what I would do is point out that I believe there's a bit of a difference. There's a lot of overlap, but there is some difference between phonics for decoding and phonics for encoding in the way it stores in the brain. I'll give you an example. If you learn in your phonics system all of the letter combinations that make the sound A, you would say, well, there's A with nothing, there's A with the E on the end, there's EA, there's AE, there's EI, there's EIGH, there's AY, and there might even be more I didn't mention, but that's a good number of those, right? Now, if you have learned all that, that is very useful when you're reading. Because you see a word and you go, ha ha, that's one of them A sounds, right? But if you're writing something and you want to write a word and you say, hmm, I need an A sound to go in this word. Is it A with an E, A without an E, E, I, A, right? And you run through all the possibilities, you don't know, then how are you gonna, how are you gonna write it? You, you'd kind of have to guess, right? And it, would, it makes it particularly difficult because you have to know whether you're trying to kill someone or ride in the thing. Slay and slay. They sound exactly the same, right? <laughs> but what you're going to do with this thing makes a world of difference in how you spell it. So um, this is where I would suggest that when you teach, when you get a kid reading, you're pretty much done with the phonics for decoding, right? And they can read pretty much stuff you throw at them, maybe a little stumbling, but it's getting easier and easier and mission accomplished. But now you need also to think about phonics for encoding. And it's pretty painfully random, right? For example, there is no logical or etymological reason as to why EA says E in the word treat, but EE -E says E in the word street. And there is no treat with an EE -E and there is no street with an EA. So how do you untangle that mess? It's random, right? So you can know that EA can say E eh or E and that's helpful for decoding. But if you're trying to write a word, you've got to know where to look for the information. And so the way to de-randomize seemingly random information is to connect it with anything that it can be connected with. So this is where we get the idea of phonetic groupings and building groupings of similar words so that you can attach a new word to it. So if you learn a bunch of words where EA says E, as in treat, and repeat, and pee, the kind you eat, <laughs> and leap. If you know all those, you get another one of those. You have a place in your brain, in your mind, to put it. That goes with these, right? Then if you learn a bunch of words where EE -E says E, like street, and queen, and pee, the kind you do, and tree, then when you get another EE -E word, like steal, you know where to put it. You put it with those words. Then when you want to write the word treat, you can go look for it where you put it. And when you want to write the word steal, you can go look for it where you put it. And then there's another steal that goes over there too. And so you've got steal the metal and steal the crime, right? 
And that's how you organize and de-randomize seemingly random stuff. You with me on this? Now, there are many different ways to kind of do this. Uh, the best thing I have ever seen is an idea that I learned from the Canadians long, long ago when I first went up to Northern Alberta to take the blended sound sight program of learning back in 1990 from Mrs. Ingham. That's where I learned the writing program of structure and style. And this idea is not for sale. It's not something that you can just buy. Unfortunately, it's really something you have to make. But the good thing is if you make it, it will be personalized to you and you can build it as you go. In fact, the last thing you would ever want to do is, is buy this thing fully built. The best thing to do is build it little by little over time with your children. And the idea is Sound City. This is Mrs. Ingham's idea. And she had it on the wall in her classroom. And the idea here, and we can take a look at a picture of it, is that you can't see it all that well, but here's a little, a, a little town. It appears to be somewhat of a medieval town because there seems to be a castle in the background, but then there's a radio station there too. <laughs> so I don't know. But the idea is that you have buildings, and in the buildings live words, families or groups of words, and these words share phonetic commonalities. Right? So you can have A Street, and you can have the AY at the end of Word's house, the AI in the middle of Word's house, the EI says A house, the EIGH says A house. So you can have four houses on A Street, and then when you get a word that uses the sound, you can put that word in one of those houses. Um, and you can do this in any number of ways. You see there's a river going through. That is the Shiver River. And inside the Shiver River live words that kind of break the rule that the E should make the vowel say its name. Words like give should be give. And have should behave. It should behave. <laughs> but it doesn't. It's have, right? So you, you then can put words like that in the Shiver River and store them there. Then when you get another one, you can put it with them. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of hard to see from where you are, uh, but that's the idea of the thing. Down along the bottom, you see a train. That is the consonant digraph train, where you get the CH, PH, TH, TCH, and SH sounds. So you get in the train, and you can go ch 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 Right? And then when you get a word like watch that uses that TCH business, you can attach it to that car in the constant digraph train. Now, you obviously will not attach every word that you would ever come across in the English language to houses and buildings and structures and features in your sound city. But, and this is not a visual teaching method. This is a visual representation of an internal organization that's starting to happen. Now, you can make one of these on a bulletin board um, and put up fancy things. Really, I, the last one I did was just put your paper on a wall and a felt marker, and we just drew on it. Little did I know the felt marker would sink through the butcher paper. But we left that house and left that wall for someone else to figure out what to do with it. But it was funny. When we left that house, um, one of the questions the kids asked was, we're going to take our sound city, aren't we? I said, absolutely, we're going to take this thing. And so we rolled it up and took it to the next house and put it back out. Only that time I put it on something that wouldn't sink through the walls. So it's very helpful. This is a little bit of a closer up view. So you see the you know, the A-I, the A-Y, the A with the E at the end, and then the A with an other vowel than the E, making the A say its name. Then you have E Street with E-E, -E, short E, E-A, and Y that says E at the end. Then you have I Street with an open I, an I-G-H, an I with an E on the end, a Y at the end saying I. And so you see how those are kind of organized. And again, you're not going to put all the words there, 
but you can put enough that there's a base. Now, every sound city will need a jail. <laughs> Words that break rules, because there's a lot of those. So <laughs> I did this with my little preschool kids. I had a nice cork board, and I started putting up my nice city sound. And by the late in the year, um, the jail was getting pretty crowded. <laughs> Uh, because they would come up with words, and I didn't have any place to put these words, and they were just so anomalous, you couldn't really create a new building for them, a new house or something. And I looked at that, and I saw in the jail, we had put, for some reason I do not know, the word ballet, the word chandelier, and the word escargot. Now, don't ask me how five-year-olds knew these words. It's <laughs> It's probably my fault, but nevertheless. And I thought, those are all French words. So that morning, before the students came, I created a new building, the French Embassy. <laughs> and I put a little French flag on top of the French Embassy. And I moved the words out of the jail into the French Embassy. And we got in our little chairs, and we rode the constant digraph train, and we got to Sound City. And I said, does anyone recognize anything that's different? Yeah, yeah, there's a new house. Hey, something's missing from the jail. Oh, it's in the new house. I worked on the idea an embassy is like a piece of a country inside another country where you can go to be safe from the laws of the country you're in. <laughs> I worked on this idea, but it was whatever. Anyway, they're in there. So, uh, you know, then once we got a French word that didn't fit English, we could stick it in the French embassy. So, you know, it's a very creative thing. There's no one way to do it. There's a thousand or 10,000 different ways to do it. But it is an idea that works. And I'd like to mention our phonetic farm, which is the same idea, but much simpler for younger children. But really, we've used the Sound City uh, I've seen school teachers use it all up even through middle school to help organize spelling information for students. Now, if you wanted someone to become, or maybe you yourself would like to become, a truly excellent speller, like way above average speller, who could spell fairly obscure words or even spell words you never saw before. Let's say you wanted to compete in the National Spelling Bee. How would you prepare for that? Right? Well, now, it's very interesting to watch the spelling bee because it's quite humbling, is it not? Have you ever done that? Watch the Scripps final rounds, and there's like these little kids are 13 years old. Here you're this old person who's been alive decades, and you hear this word you've never heard before. You have no idea what it is, what it means, or how to spell it. And this kid, like, boom. Very humbling. But it's interesting because they get clues. What are the three clues they get in order to have help to figure out how to spell the word? Do you know? Country, Country of origin or language of origin. Definition. Definition and use it in a sentence, which allows them to define the part of speech. So with the origin, definition, and part of speech, they can apply information that information and narrow down the possibilities of the correct spelling of a word. So the 1999 National Spelling Bee, the, the winning word was logoria. Now, you probably haven't heard this word before. I had never heard this word before. I don't have any context for it. But if I give you the definition, you might be able to spell it. Logoria is a pathological condition of talking too much. Now you'd know how to spell it if you know that other pathological condition of putting out too much. Right? And so what's the value here? Well, the value, of course, is in studying roots, primarily Greek and Latin word roots. So whether you choose to study Latin or not, and I would say studying Latin from a grammar perspective is one of the best things you can possibly do with your time, but 60% of English words of three syllables or more are derived from Latin. Another good quantity are derived from Greek. 
So you would start there with Greek and Latin word roots. Now, the great thing is if you learn a root, it's pretty easy to now create a category and attach a bunch of other stuff to it. So if you learn cron, C-H-R-O-N, then you can very easily spell words like chronic, chronicle, chronometer, asynchronous, right? Chronological. You got a whole group of words now you can spell because you learned the root, right? And so logo rhea is a Greek word, logos word, rhea, I suppose, whatever that was in the original, we know what it is in <laughs> our application of it. So this is why I would strongly recommend that if you want a good speller, or even a pretty good speller, you want to be sure to have some way to study and learn Greek and Latin word roots. And you can start at a pretty young age. Um, I don't know where I got these things, and I don't have them anymore, and I'm very sad because I wish I did. Uh, someday maybe we'll make them. But I had this very nice set of large cards with pictures and words that were roots. And I would, I would use the card with my preschool kids, right? My, my little kids, five, six years old. And so it had a picture of a ship going into a port, and the word was port. And then it had other derivatives, so I could show the picture, say port means in Latin to carry. The ship is carrying stuff, right? So when you carry your lunch into the classroom, you import. When you carry your, your garbage out of the classroom, you export. When you tell me what Johnny did to you, you report. <laughs> and if Johnny doesn't stop doing that, it may be deport for him, right? And so, you know, and so you can build this up. And there's lots of ways that you can do it. So, you know, I think a lot of creative parents and teachers can just get the root and then make up stuff and maybe draw some pictures and, and go with this. There are a few programs that are available. Um, I don't really love any of them. I would like to create one that I would love, but I got other stuff to do at the moment. Uh, but you can do this. Then, of course, there are other routes. And I would commend you to two movies that are actually both very good. One of them is a documentary film about the script Spelling Bee. It's called Spellbound, which sounds kind of like a witchcraft movie or something, but it's not. It's a documentary, and it's very interesting because it shows kind of the kids who get to the finalist level, how they studied, how they prepared, how they worked. Um, so that's available. And then the other movie is one of the best movies that I think came out of the last century, and that was um, Aquila and the Bee. Uh, Starbucks Entertainment, who would have guessed? And what's so brilliant about that is they made one movie and then they stopped while they were ahead. Uh, Aquila and the Bee is a beautiful movie about a kind of inner city African-American girl who doesn't want to, but gets kind of cajoled into doing the school spelling bee. And she wins. She goes to regionals. She gets to nationals. And all the way, it's how the community supports her. And she has a coach. Um, who's that guy who played Morpheus in Fishburne? Lawrence Fishburne. Magnificent job in this movie. He's the... He's the Dr. Laramie who, who coached her. And there's so much to be gained from watching this movie. In fact, it was pretty funny. I watched the movie with my kids, and the result was they all wanted to do more spelling. <laughs> uh, and there's probably one of the most perfect moral lessons that happens at the very end of the movie. Uh, this is one of those few movies like Sound of Music. I could watch it. I could watch it a dozen times and never grow tired of this movie. So those two movies, very good. All right, so uh, I think that is most of what we have to uh, talk about. I, I should mention, in passing, that we do have a spelling program that is called the Phonetic Zoo, and it is based on the idea of auditory input and customized repetition to mastery. So the way it works is you, you basically get an audio recording, and then there's some printed materials, but those are actually more for you than for the kids. And the word is uh, said, used in a sentence, and said uh, again. 
And during that space, the child attempts to write the word on a piece of paper. There are 15 words in each lesson, and all of the words are connected by some type of common phonetic element. Usually the diphthongs or the digraphs or the weird letter combinations, stuff like that. Or it will take two, like lesson one is AY at the end and AI in the middle. So all the words are going to have AI, AY at the end or AI in the middle. And, uh, and so the child attempts to write the word. There's 15 words. And every third word, the rule, jingle, or hint is repeated. So they hear that four times each day. Then the next track on the, the recording is the correct spelling being read aloud. So this is where the learning occurs. This is where they would compare what they wrote with what they hear one letter at a time. Okay. If they get it correct, they circle it. If they get it incorrect, they attempt to write the correct spelling next to that word. And they just do 15 words. And it takes you know somewhere between maybe 12, 15, 17 minutes to self-test, self-correct. And then the trick of this is they do the same lesson every day, five or six days a week, until they get 100% twice in a row. So they may start out not knowing anything. Well, that's OK. We didn't expect it. And you get three right and you know, thir four, 12 wrong. Well, don't, don't sweat it. Next day, maybe they get five right and 10 wrong. Hey, that's progress. Next day, they may get eight right and seven wrong. Getting better. Maybe the next day they get, you know, 13 right and two wrong. Getting close. 14 right, one wrong. Then the next day, 14 right and one wrong, but a different one. Why? Because they didn't know that they knew that they knew it. Ah, now. Next day, 15 right. One more time, all 15 right, graduate the lesson. It doesn't matter whether it takes four days, 14 days, or 40 days. There's no schedule. There's no grade level. There's no thing you have to accomplish by a certain date. But what we do know is that when you finish the lesson, you will know that you know that you know these words. And then there's some embedded repetition, but you as a parent can add more. And then every fifth lesson is a personal spelling lesson, where we give you a blank card. You write in 15 or 20 words. Could be anything, capitals, names, books of the Bible, whatever you like, things they missed in writing assignments they did. And then you verbally administer that just the way the recording does. And uh, so we have three levels of that. And you can take a placement test off our website and see, OK, if you get x number right, go to the next test. If you get x number right, go to the next one. If you don't, stick at this level. And we've had pretty good luck with that over the years. It hasn't changed much. And it's been 23 years <laughs> since we made that program. We updated it once just to get rid of typos and things. Uh, but I have had many, many reports of people who had a, you know, older kid, 11, 12, and just spelling was horrific. And so they got rid of the workbook, went into the auditory drill approach, and started to see much better results. So thank you so much for your attention. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.